Remember my Mexican presidential election series? Well, I went over pretty much the entirety of the post-revolutionary Mexican presidential tenures during this time. And so a thought came into my mind, how would I personally rank these administrations? And as you may have guessed, this video series is going to do just that. I will be looking over the administrations of all of the post-revolutionary Mexican presidents and rank them. However, since I want to get the bad out of the way from, you know, last year, we're going to be going over the worst presidents first. First, let's establish some quick ground rules. 1917 and beyond. You see, all the presidential elections up to that point were pretty much the Senate choosing president, rigged elections, da -da -da. so it would probably be best for us to look over ones that the Mexican people had decided, plus these are the ones you're probably the most familiar with due to the fact that I covered them on my channel, plus due to the fact that these are the more political presidents I guess you could say, some of them are just broadly anti whatever, like it doesn't matter. I will give a special shout out on the worst list to a pre-revolutionary president, Porfirio Diaz. That's just a quick shout out. The best presidents list will also have a shout out to a, pre a previous president before revolution. Second ground rule, I will be going over their tenures only, even though some of these guys it's a little hard to tell where their tenures begin and end, and what good and bad we should count. But we'll, we'll see overall if it counts overall. And lastly, this guy will not be making an appearance on either list because he is still in office. And it would be very bad for me to label him until he's at least out of office. With all that in the way, here are the worst Mexican presidents in Mexican history. Number 11, Emilio Portes Gu. He is the first of the Maximano presidents and one of two presidential appointments. His short tenure did have a bit of interesting moments. He ended the Cristero War and established peace with Mexican Catholics. And unlike most other presidents on this list, he has combated student protests in a good way by giving the University of Mexico its own autonomy so it can make its own rules. He also tried to stop government officials from enriching themselves. It inevitably failed, but it was a good effort. He also shifted a ton of government funds to public works such as schools and hospitals, and he also helped with the ridding of the Caistas from power after they were tossed to the curb. Overall, he's alright, but, you know, he's just overall average. Just slightly above average, if anything. Number 12, Adolfo de la Huerta. Honestly, Huerta is the lesser of the Adolfos, though it's really not his fault. He's not bad per se. It's just that six months really isn't an adequate amount of time to form an explicitly great or explicitly horrible administration. His sole purpose was literally just keep the seat warm and make sure Mexico wouldn't fall into disarray after the literal coup that just happened. The only real policy-oriented thing that he did was that he negotiated a deal to get Pancho Villa to step down and reward him for his help in the Mexican Revolution, but otherwise, like I said, he was pretty much just there. Number 13, Miguel Aleman Valdez. Aleman was the better version of a style that's more commonplace in the modern day, the young, dashing glimmer of hope. That is pretty much just centrist neoliberalism establishmentarianism with a more appealing paint job. The emphasis for him was that he was going to be the first post-revolutionary president that wasn't going to be a general in the Mexican Revolution, which was kind of a big deal as he would set the precedent for future presidents down the line, and he even tried to set a good example. He put up pictures of Benito Juarez all across Mexico in order to signify that the time of the civilian president is here and it will no longer be run by military men. However, the precedents that he also chose to push were corruption and being very friendly to business. But inevitably, 
Alamon was just the first or second step in the gradual decline, in as much as you could say. Number 14, Ernesto Zedillo. Zedillo continued the neoliberal policies of his predecessors, but did make some positive changes that made him better than most of the other neolibs. First, the bad, he led the privatization of the state railway industry, and he apparently gave a far-right military group the okay to commit a massacre on a group of indigenous people in an attempt to quell the support that the Zapatistas had, which immediately backfired as the Zapatistas were able to say, hey, the government literally ordered a bunch of indigenous people killed, so why don't you join us so we could prevent that from happening in the future? And his administration devalued the peso, nearly causing an economic collapse. Now the good, he created a poverty alleviation program, that's always a good thing, but two more important things were the reforms of the electoral system so drastically that it was pretty much the final nail in the coffin of the PRI's one-party rule, and the second thing being him literally giving up power. You see, Zadil, he was literally being told by people in his administration, buddy, you can just say that the PAN rigged the 2000 election, and you can stay in power, and the priest can rule forever, but he actually did choose to voluntarily step down from the administration and commit to a peaceful transition of power, a thing that <laughs> some presidents in America don't even know how to do. I'm not particularly a fan of the administration that was leaving or the administration that was coming in, but it is admirable that the administrations did change and there wasn't a violent coup. Number 15, Carlos Salinas Gortari. This guy was so bad, the incumbent president literally had to rig the election in order for him to get elected. Because his platform certainly didn't do it for them. I mean, his first job when he got into the office was jailing prominent union leaders that didn't like him. He privatized state-run industries such as Telefonos de Mexico and started selling them to pre-insiders. And he also created NAFTA. He signed off on NAFTA, pretty much. That's not necessarily the most popular thing that a Mexican president has done. I mean, the last thing was so mad, people literally decided to take up arms and took over half the state of Chiapas. He clearly didn't have that many fans. And the 1994 election had some really interesting moments, considering the fact that the majority of Mexico literally thinks that he has killed his party's presidential nominee to make way for a more bootlicking person to be his replacement. You'd think murder would get you lower than that, but I mean, if you know anything about Mexico's presidents, you ain't seen nothing yet. Number 16, Luis Echeverria. He did some okay things during his administration, but he was pretty much bogged down by the many, many, many bad things he did. First is the one thing prior to his presidency that I just really can't overlook was that he helped with the literal massacre in Tlatelolco, and we'll get to that in a second, but he tried to distance himself from that due to its unpopularity, but you can't really distance yourself from a literal massacre. But the authoritarianism didn't really end when he decided he was going to take office, as Echeverria started and or escalated the Mexican Dirty War, which was pretty much a more violent version of COINTELPRO. He hated leftist activist groups so much that when killing them didn't work, he thought maybe banning rock and roll music would stop their leftist activities. It didn't work, but it does show that art is always political, but Mexico kinda already knew that since, like, their second president after the revolution. Number 17, Vicente Fox. He was the first opposition candidate to beat the PRI by running a populist-oriented campaign, and what did he do when he got elected? Mostly continue Mexico's neoliberal policies, but with a more right-wing bend. Like, the PRI was literally so bad that even socialists were apparently willing to get on board with Vincente Fox's candidacy. And, unsurprisingly, 
things didn't turn out so well when they nominated a conservative president. One thing that can define, like, the first half of his presidency was violence. He tried to kick poor farmers off of their land to build an airport, and he sent troops to go kill them. When Mexico State s tried to kick a bunch of flower vendors off of their, like, places to live, he sent federal troops to help with the beating and raping of protesters. But the second half of his presidency was focused on the massive failure regarding his attempted impeachment of AMLO, which was very blatantly for political reasons. He tried to justify it any way he can, but everybody was able to pick apart the fact that he was doing this 100% just for political reasons to get an enemy off of his list. And it also had the unintended consequence of raising AMLO's profile to the point where he could mount a very viable campaign against the PAN in the 2006 election. As much as he likes to crap on Donald Trump, he kind of sort of is just like him. He came and be like, oh, I'm going to tear the establishment down and I'm going to build a new cool thingy. But he just ended up joining the establishment to the point where he didn't even back his party's candidate in the following elections. He's backed the party ever since. Though to be fair, he is the more, I guess, likable version of the PAN's two presidencies. And they were probably mad when he actually decided to leave the party, as he is rather still kind of popular. Speaking of PAN presidents, however, number 18, Felipe Calderon, the only other PAN president, and definitely the lesser of the two. I mean, Fox literally had to kind of Jeb Bush his e-hole in order to get Felipe into the presidential palace in the first place. To be fair, he did do some things that were kind of alright, but then I mean singular or popular, but the biggest thing that drags him down is the Mexican drug war. That's a big down, to be honest. 41,034 people are dead because of Calderon's decision. Calderon was literally so bad that people literally were thinking, Dude, I know the PRI corruptly ruled us for like 70 years, but maybe we shouldn't trust Felipe's party? They gave us Felipe, so maybe we should just go back to the pre. Like, I mean, he was so bad and so unliked that when his wife wanted to run for president, they were like, mm -mm, mm -mm, no, 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 bad, we can't have you. You're associated with him. No. Hmm. I compared Vincente Fox to Jeb Bush, but technically, I guess technically Calderon also can be compared to Jeb Bush. I mean, think about it. They didn't want Jeb Bush because of his association with the other Bush. So, just saying, it's like poetry and rhymes. Unlike Vincente Fox, I'm pretty sure when Calderon decided that he was going to leave the pan party, they were pretty much ecstatic. And another testament to his unpopularity, he tried to start a party of his own, and it's not doing so hot. It hasn't even been registered. It can be registered at this point, because as I said before, not a lot of people like him. With all this crap talking in an otherwise objective video, you would think that... You know, he's the most unpopular, explicitly modern-day Mexican president. But as Yoda once said, no, there is another. Number 19, Enrique Peña Nieto. Nieto was literally so bad during his tenure, some people were legitimately nostalgic for the literal dictator during his administration. That's pretty bad. First, we should probably address his continuing failures of Calderon with the drug war. During his presidential run, he tried to do both things at once. Quell violence, while also continuing the war. He inevitably had to choose, and he chose... War. Though, of course, talking bad about Nieto shouldn't really be talked about unless we address, of course, his biggest policy... The privatization of Pemex. Now despite what Time Magazine wants you to think, rising gas prices were not necessarily popular amongst the Mexican people. It also showed his very, very corrupt deals. You see, while he was 
running for president, an oil executive was funding his campaign. Then after his campaign was done, that same oil executive became the head of Pemex. And coincidentally, the company that that oil executive worked for all of a sudden got a bunch of contracts due to his association as Pemex's boss. Coincidence? Hmm. Nietzsche would want you to think so. Journalists that actually dared to cover his corrupt business dealings were actually spied on. And of course, we should address the tragic mass kidnapping that implicated federal troops being the biggest example of his administration. Yeah, um, there's a reason that he has a 12% approval rating and will more than likely never be anywhere close to public office again. Now, of course, this is definitely a hard record to beat in order to be worse than this, but unfortunately, Mexico can supply. Number 20, Miguel de Madrid, the first explicitly neoliberal president, is really this low on the list. Hmm, maybe there's a reason for that. You see, Madrid's market-oriented philosophy essentially made Mexico fall further down the rabbit hole it was already in. They had a 159% inflation rate in like his second to last year in office. But of course, his biggest failure in office was his handling of the 1985 Mexican City earthquake. It was just a complete disaster. It showed his neoliberal colors 100%, by showing that he cared much more about the factory machines and the bottom line of the factory owners rather than the literal dead workers inside. The city literally begged him to send anybody down there to help, and he didn't do it. He sent them down there explicitly to help remove factory machines because business owners told him it would hurt his bottom line. Wanna know what else isn't necessarily cool? His flat out rigging of the 1988 election because his administration was such a departure from what the PRI used to be, that they were like, hmm, this guy's running on the idea of being what the PRI used to be. Though I guess if you're an accelerationist, you should probably be thanking him, because he is one of the individuals that showed that it had to get worse before it got better. Now you might say this, this has to be the lowest on the list, right? Well, number 21. Gustavo Diaz Ordaz. This guy was literally the most authoritarian person to ever govern Mexico outside of Porfirio Diaz and the literal Mexican emperors. Like, he went so hard on strikes from literally anybody who opposed him. Doctors, railroad workers, teachers, and in the worst case, students. That, of course, is a recollection of the Tlaxcala Loco Massacre, where he not only killed 400 university students, not only did he do it by ordering snipers to shoot at his own troops so that they would believe that the students would be shooting at them, so that they would be able to shoot without even thinking of a second glance, but he initiated a mass government cover-up in order to make people think, oh, I, I had nothing to do with this. Even though everybody knew that he did it. Probably didn't know the extent, but a lot of people knew that there was a bigger death count than what the Mexican government was telling them. Mexicans hate him so much that if you want to paint any Mexican president as a bad person, he's one of the go-to ones. Like, you know how in America we'll usually, like, paint a Hitler mustache on someone to indicate that they are like a bad person. Well, in Mexico, you'd paint him with the Diaz mustache or with the Ordez glasses because these two are just so hated. Like, just to be as blunt as you could possibly be, Gustavo Diaz Ordez is the worst post-revolutionary president Mexico has ever had thus far. So yeah, now that we got all the bad out of the way, join me in two weeks, where we will look over the good Mexican presidents. 
and not all of them will just be there by virtue. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Facebook, join my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report.